Title 13. Special Corporations. Chapter I. Educational Corporations. Section 105. Incorporation. Educational corporations shall be governed by special laws and by the general provisions of this code. Section 106. Board of Trustees. Trustees of educational institutions organized as non-stock corporations shall not be less than five nor more than fifteen, provided that the number of trustees shall be in multiples of five. Unless otherwise provided in the Articles of Incorporation or Bylaws, the Board of Trustees of Incorporated Schools, Colleges, or other institutions of learning shall, as soon as organized, so classify themselves that the term of office of one-fifth of their number shall expire every year. Trustees thereafter elected to fill vacancies, occurring before the expiration of a particular term, shall hold office only for the unexpired period. Trustees elected thereafter to fill vacancies caused by expiration of term shall hold office for five years. A majority of the trustees shall constitute a quorum for the transaction of business. The powers and authority of trustees shall be defined in the bylaws. For institutions organized as stock corporations, the number and term of directors shall be governed by the provisions on stock corporations. Chapter 2. Religious Corporations. Section 107. Classes of Religious Corporations. Religious corporations may be incorporated by one or more persons. Such corporations may be classified into corporations sole and religious societies. Religious corporations shall be governed by this chapter and by the general provisions on non-stock corporations insofar as applicable. Section 108. Corporation Sole. For the purpose of administering and managing, as trustee, the affairs, property and temporalities of any religious denomination, sect or church, a corporation sole may be formed by the chief archbishop, bishop, priest, minister, rabbi, or other presiding elder of such religious denomination, sect, or church. Section 109. Articles of Incorporation. In order to become a corporation sole, the chief archbishop, bishop, priest, minister, rabbi or presiding elder of any religious denomination, sect or church must file with the commission articles of incorporation setting forth the following. A. That the applicant chief archbishop, bishop, priest, minister, rabbi, or presiding elder represents the religious denomination, sect, or church which desires to become a corporation sole. b. That the rules, regulations and discipline of the religious denomination, sect or church are consistent with becoming a corporation sole and do not forbid it. c. That such chief archbishop, bishop, priest, minister, rabbi, or presiding elder is charged with the administration of the temporalities and the management of the affairs, estate and properties of the religious denomination, sect or church within the territorial jurisdiction, so described succinctly in the Articles of Incorporation. d. The manner by which any vacancy occurring in the office of chief archbishop, bishop, priest, minister, rabbi, or presiding elder is required to be filled according to the rules, regulations or discipline of the religious denomination, sect or church, and e. the place where the principal office of the corporation sole is to be established and located, which place must be within the territory of the Philippines. The Articles of Incorporation may include any other provision not contrary to law for the regulation of the affairs of the corporation. Section 110. Submission of the Articles of Incorporation. The Articles of Incorporation must be verified, by affidavit or affirmation of the Chief Archbishop, Bishop, Priest, Minister, Rabbi, or Presiding Elder, as the case may be, and accompanied by a copy of the Commission, Certificate of Election or Letter of Appointment of such Chief Archbishop, Bishop, Priest, Minister, Rabbi, or Presiding Elder, duly certified to be correct by any notary public. From and after filing with the Commission of the said Articles of Incorporation, verified by affidavit or affirmation, and accompanied by the documents mentioned in the preceding paragraph, such chief archbishop, bishop, priest, minister, rabbi, or presiding elder shall become a corporation sole and all temporalities, estate and properties of the religious denomination, sect or church theretofore administered or managed as such chief archbishop, bishop, priest, minister, rabbi, or presiding elder shall be personally held in trust as a corporation sole, for the use, purpose exclusive benefit and on behalf of the religious denomination, sect or church, including hospitals, schools, colleges, orphan asylums, parsonages, and cemeteries thereof. Section 111. Acquisition and Alienation of Property. A corporation sole may purchase and hold real estate and personal property for its church, charitable, benevolent, or educational purposes, and may receive bequests or gifts for such purposes. 
such corporation may sell or mortgage real property held by it by obtaining an order for that purpose from the regional trial court of the province where the property is situated upon proof that the notice of the application for leave to sell or mortgage has been made through publication or as directed by the court, and that it is in the interest of the corporation that leave to sell or mortgage be granted. The application for leave to sell or mortgage must be made by petition, duly verified, by the chief archbishop, bishop, priest, minister, rabbi, or presiding elder acting as corporation sole, and may be opposed by any member of the religious denomination, sect or church represented by the corporation sole, provided, that in cases where the rules, regulations, and discipline of the religious denomination, sect or church, religious society, or order concerned represented by such corporation sole regulate the method of acquiring, holding, selling, and mortgaging real estate and personal property. Such rules, regulations and discipline shall govern, and the intervention of the courts shall not be necessary. Section 112. Filling of vacancies. The successors in office of any chief archbishop, bishop, priest, minister, rabbi, or presiding elder in a corporation soul shall become the corporation soul on their accession to office and shall be permitted to transact business as such upon filing a copy of their commission, certificate of election, or letters of appointment, duly certified by any notary public with the commission. During any vacancy in the office of chief archbishop, bishop, priest, minister, rabbi, or presiding elder of any religious denomination, sect or church incorporated as a corporation sole, the person or persons authorized by the rules, regulations or discipline of the religious denomination, sect or church represented by the corporation sole to administer the temporalities and manage the affairs, estate, and properties of the corporation sole shall exercise all the powers and authority of the corporation sole during such vacancy. Section. 113. Dissolution. A corporation sole may be dissolved and its affairs settled voluntarily by submitting to the Commission a verified declaration of dissolution, setting forth a. The name of the corporation. b. The reason for dissolution and winding up. c. The authorization for the dissolution of the corporation by the particular religious denomination, sect or church, and d. The names and addresses of the persons who are to supervise the winding up of the affairs of the corporation. Upon approval of such declaration of dissolution by the Commission, the corporation shall cease to carry on its operations except for the purpose of winding up its affairs. Section 114. Religious Societies. Unless forbidden by competent authority, the Constitution, pertinent rules, regulations, or discipline of the religious denomination, sect or church of which it is a part, any religious society, religious order, diocese, synod, or district organization of any religious denomination, sect or church, may, upon written consent and or by an affirmative vote at a meeting called for the purpose of at least two-thirds of its membership, incorporate for the administration of its temporalities or for the management of its affairs, properties, and estate by filing with the commission, articles of incorporation verified by the affidavit of the presiding elder, secretary, or clerk or other member of such religious society or religious order, or diocese, synod, or district organization of the religious denomination, sect or church, setting forth the following. a. That the religious society or religious order, or diocese, synod, or district organization is a religious organization of a religious denomination, sect or church. b. That at least two-thirds of its membership has given written consent or has voted to incorporate, at a duly convened meeting of the body. c. That the incorporation of the religious society or religious order, or diocese, synod, or district organization is not forbidden by competent authority or by the constitution, rules, regulations or discipline of the religious denomination, sect or church of which it forms part. d. That the religious society or religious order, or diocese, synod, or district organization desires to incorporate for the administration of its affairs, properties and estate. e. The place within the Philippines where the principal office of the corporation is to be established and located, and f. The names, nationalities, and residence addresses of the trustees, not less than five nor more than fifteen, elected by the religious society or religious order, or the diocese, synod, or district organization to serve for the first year or such other period as may be prescribed by the laws of the religious society or religious order, or of the diocese, synod, or district organization. Chapter 3 one-person corporations. Section 115. Applicability of provisions to one-person corporations. The provisions of this title shall primarily apply to one-person corporations. Other provisions of this code apply supplatorily, except as otherwise provided in this title. Section 116. One-person corporation. A one-person corporation is a corporation with a single stockholder. 
provided that only a natural person, trust, or an estate may form a one-person corporation. Banks and quasi-banks, pre-need, trust, insurance, public and publicly listed companies, and non-chartered government-owned and controlled corporations may not incorporate as one-person corporations. Provided, further, that a natural person who is licensed to exercise a profession may not organize as a one-person corporation for the purpose of exercising such profession except as otherwise provided under special laws. Section 117. Minimum capital stock required for one-person corporation. A one-person corporation shall not be required to have a minimum authorized capital stock except as otherwise provided by special law. Section 118. Articles of Incorporation. A one-person corporation shall file articles of incorporation in accordance with the requirements under Section 14 of this Code. It shall likewise substantially contain the following. a. If the single stockholder is a trust or an estate, the name, nationality, and residence of the trustee, administrator, executor, guardian, conservator, custodian, or other person exercising fiduciary duties together with the proof of such authority to act on behalf of the trust or estate, and b. Name, nationality, residence of the nominee and alternate nominee, and the extent, coverage and limitation of the authority. Section 119. Bylaws. The one-person corporation is not required to submit and file corporate bylaws. Section 120. Display of corporate name. A one-person corporation shall indicate the letters OPC either below or at the end of its corporate name. Section 121. Single stockholder as director, president. The single stockholder shall be the sole director and president of the one-person corporation. Section 122. Treasurer, corporate secretary, and other officers. Within 15 days from the issuance of its certificate of incorporation, the one-person corporation shall appoint a treasurer, corporate secretary, and other officers as it may deem necessary, and notify the commission thereof within five days from appointment. The single stockholder may not be appointed as the corporate secretary. A single stockholder who is likewise the self-appointed treasurer of the corporation shall give a bond to the commission in such a sum as may be required, provided that the said stockholder treasurer shall undertake in writing to faithfully administer the one-person corporation's funds to be received as treasurer and to disburse and invest the same according to the articles of incorporation as approved by the commission. The bond shall be renewed every two years or as often as may be required. Section 123. Special Functions of the Corporate Secretary. In addition to the functions designated by the one-person corporation, the corporate secretary shall a. be responsible for maintaining the minutes book and or records of the corporation. b. notify the nominee or alternate nominee of the death or incapacity of the single stockholder, which notice shall be given no later than five days from such occurrence. c. Notify the commission of the death of the single stockholder within five days from such occurrence and stating in such notice the names, residence addresses, and contact details of all known legal heirs, and d. Call the nominee or alternate nominee and the known legal heirs to a meeting and advise the legal heirs with regard to, among others, the election of a new director, amendment of the Articles of Incorporation, and other ancillary and or consequential matters. Section 124. Nominee and Alternate Nominee. The single stockholder shall designate a nominee and an alternate nominee who shall, in the event of the single stockholder's death or incapacity, take the place of the single stockholder as director and shall manage the corporation's affairs. The Articles of Incorporation shall state the names, residence addresses and contact details of the nominee and alternate nominee, as well as the extent and limitations of their authority in managing the affairs of the one-person corporation. The written consent of the nominee and alternate nominee shall be attached to the application for incorporation. Such consent may be withdrawn in writing any time before the death or incapacity of the single stockholder. Section 125. Term of nominee and alternate nominee. When the incapacity of the single stockholder is temporary, the nominee shall sit as director and manage the affairs of the one-person corporation until the stockholder, by self-determination, regains the capacity to assume such duties. In case of death or permanent incapacity of the single stockholder, the nominee shall sit as director and manage the affairs of the one-person corporation until the legal heirs of the single stockholder have been lawfully determined, and the heirs have designated one of them or have agreed that the estate shall be the single stockholder of the one-person corporation. The alternate nominee shall sit as director and manage the one-person corporation in case of the nominee's inability, incapacity, death, or refusal to discharge the functions as director and manager of the corporation 
and only for the same term and under the same conditions applicable to the nominee. Section 126. Change of nominee or alternate nominee. The single stockholder may, at any time, change its nominee and alternate nominee by submitting to the commission the names of the new nominees and their corresponding written consent. For this purpose, the Articles of Incorporation need not be amended. Section 127. Minutes Book. A one-person corporation shall maintain a minutes book which shall contain all actions, decisions, and resolutions taken by the one-person corporation. Section 128. Records in lieu of meetings. When action is needed on any matter, it shall be sufficient to prepare a written resolution, signed and dated by the single stockholder, and recorded in the minutes book of the one-person corporation. The date of recording in the minutes book shall be deemed to be the date of the meeting for all purposes under this code. Section 129. Repertorial Requirements. The one-person corporation shall submit the following within such period as the Commission may prescribe. a. Annual financial statements audited by an independent certified public accountant. Provided, that if the total assets or total liabilities of the corporation are less than 600,000 pesos, the financial statements shall be certified under oath by the corporation's treasurer and president. b. A report containing explanations or comments by the president on every qualification, reservation, or adverse remark or disclaimer made by the auditor in the latter's report. c. A disclosure of all self-dealings and related party transactions entered into between the one-person corporation and the single stockholder, and d. Other reports as the commission may require. For purposes of this provision, the fiscal year of a one-person corporation shall be that set forth in its Articles of Incorporation or, in the absence thereof, the calendar year. The Commission may place the corporation under delinquent status should the corporation fail to submit the repertorial requirements three times, consecutively or intermittently, within a period of five years. Section 130. Liability of single shareholder. A sole shareholder claiming limited liability has the burden of affirmatively showing that the corporation was adequately financed. Where the single stockholder cannot prove that the property of the one-person corporation is independent of the stockholder's personal property, the stockholder shall be jointly and severally liable for the debts and other liabilities of the one-person corporation. The principles of piercing the corporate veil applies with equal force to one-person corporations as with other corporations. Section 131. Conversion from an ordinary corporation to a one-person corporation. When a single stockholder acquires all the stocks of an ordinary stock corporation, the latter may apply for conversion into a one-person corporation, subject to the submission of such documents as the Commission may require. If the application for conversion is approved, the Commission shall issue a Certificate of Filing of Amended Articles of Incorporation reflecting the conversion. The one-person corporation converted from an ordinary stock corporation shall succeed the latter and be legally responsible for all the latter's outstanding liabilities as of the date of conversion. Section 132. Conversion from a one-person corporation to an ordinary stock corporation. A one-person corporation may be converted into an ordinary stock corporation after due notice to the commission of such fact and of the circumstances leading to the conversion, and after compliance with all other requirements for stock corporations under this code and applicable rules. Such notice shall be filed with the commission within 60 days from the occurrence of the circumstances leading to the conversion into an ordinary stock corporation. If all requirements have been complied with, the Commission shall issue a Certificate of Filing of Amended Articles of Incorporation reflecting the conversion. In case of death of the single stockholder, the nominee or alternate nominee shall transfer the shares to the duly designated legal heir or estate within seven days from receipt of either an affidavit of heirship or self-adjudication executed by a sole heir, or any other legal document declaring the legal heirs of the single stockholder and notify the Commission of the transfer. Within 60 days from the transfer of the shares, the legal heirs shall notify the Commission of their decision to either wind up and dissolve the one-person corporation or convert it into an ordinary stock corporation. The ordinary stock corporation converted from a one-person corporation shall succeed the latter and be legally responsible for all the latter's outstanding liabilities as of the date of conversion. Title 14 Dissolution. Section 133. Methods of Dissolution. A corporation formed or organized under the provisions of this code may be dissolved voluntarily or involuntarily. Section 134. Voluntary dissolution where no creditors are affected. If dissolution of a corporation does not prejudice the rights of any creditor having a claim against it, the dissolution may be effected by majority vote of the board of directors or trustees, 
and by a resolution adopted by the affirmative vote of the stockholders owning at least majority of the outstanding capital stock or majority of the members of a meeting to be held upon the call of the directors or trustees. At least 20 days prior to the meeting, notice shall be given to each shareholder or member of record personally, by registered mail, or by any means authorized under its bylaws. Whether or not entitled to vote at the meeting, in the manner provided in Section 50 of this Code and shall state that the purpose of the meeting is to vote on the dissolution of the corporation. Notice of the time, place, and object of the meeting shall be published once prior to the date of the meeting in a newspaper published in the place where the principal office of said corporation is located, or if no newspaper is published in such place, in a newspaper of general circulation in the Philippines. A verified request for dissolution shall be filed with the Commission stating, a, the reason for the dissolution b. The form, manner, and time when the notices were given. c. Names of the stockholders and directors or members and trustees who approved the dissolution. d. The date, place, and time of the meeting in which the vote was made. and e. Details of publication. The corporation shall submit the following to the commission. 1. A copy of the resolution authorizing the dissolution, certified by a majority of the board of directors or trustees and countersigned by the secretary of the corporation. 2. Proof of publication and 3. Favorable recommendation from the appropriate regulatory agency, when necessary. Within 15 days from receipt of the verified request for dissolution, and in the absence of any withdrawal within said period, the Commission shall approve the request and issue the Certificate of Dissolution. The dissolution shall take effect only upon the issuance by the Commission of a Certificate of Dissolution. No application for dissolution of banks, banking and quasi-banking institutions, pre-need, insurance and trust companies, NSSLAs, pawnshops, and other financial intermediaries shall be approved by the Commission unless accompanied by a favorable recommendation of the appropriate government agency. Section 135. Voluntary dissolution where creditors are affected. Procedure and contents of petition. Where the dissolution of a corporation may prejudice the rights of any creditor. A verified petition for dissolution shall be filed with the Commission. The petition shall be signed by a majority of the corporation's board of directors or trustees, verified by its president or secretary or one of its directors or trustees, and shall set forth all claims and demands against it, and that its dissolution was resolved upon by the affirmative vote of the stockholders representing at least two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock or at least two-thirds of the members at a meeting of its stockholders or members called for that purpose. The petition shall likewise state. A. The reason for the dissolution. B. The form, manner, and time when the notices were given. And C. The date, place, and time of the meeting in which the vote was made. The corporation shall submit to the Commission the following. 1. A copy of the resolution authorizing the dissolution, certified by a majority of the board of directors or trustees and countersigned by the secretary of the corporation. And 2. A list of all its creditors. If the petition is sufficient in form and substance, the Commission shall, by an order reciting the purpose of the petition, fix a deadline for filing objections to the petition which date shall not be less than 30 days nor more than 60 days after the entry of the order. Before such date, a copy of the order shall be published at least once a week for three consecutive weeks in a newspaper of general circulation published in the municipality or city. Where the principal office of the corporation is situated, or if there be no such newspaper, then in a newspaper of general circulation in the Philippines, and a similar copy shall be posted for three. Three, consecutive weeks in three public places in such municipality or city. Upon five days' notice, given after the date on which the right to file objections is fixed in the order has expired, the Commission shall proceed to hear the petition and try any issue raised in the objections filed, and if no such objection is sufficient, and the material allegations of the petition are true, it shall render judgment dissolving the corporation and directing such disposition of its assets as justice requires, and may appoint a receiver to collect such assets and pay the debts of the corporation. The dissolution shall take effect only upon the issuance by the Commission of a Certificate of Dissolution. Section 136. Dissolution by Shortening Corporate Term. A voluntary dissolution may be effected by amending the Articles of Incorporation to shorten the corporate term pursuant to the provisions of this Code. A copy of the amended Articles of Incorporation shall be submitted to the Commission in accordance with this Code. Upon the expiration of the shortened term, as stated in the approved amended Articles of Incorporation, the Corporation shall be deemed dissolved without any further proceedings, subject to the provisions of this Code on liquidation. In the case of expiration of corporate term, dissolution shall automatically take effect on the day following the last day of the corporate term stated in the Articles of Incorporation 
without the need for the issuance by the commission of a certificate of dissolution. Section 137. Withdrawal of request and petition for dissolution. A withdrawal of the request for dissolution shall be made in writing, duly verified by any incorporator, director, trustee, shareholder, or member and signed by the same number of incorporators, directors, trustees, shareholders, or members necessary to request for dissolution is set forth in the foregoing sections. The withdrawal shall be submitted no later than 15 days from receipt by the commission of the request for dissolution. Upon receipt of a withdrawal of request for dissolution, the commission shall withhold action on the request for dissolution and shall, after investigation, a, make a pronouncement that the request for dissolution is deemed withdrawn, b, direct a joint meeting of the board of directors or trustees and the stockholders or members for the purpose of ascertaining whether to proceed with dissolution, or c, issue such other orders as it may deem appropriate. A withdrawal of the petition for dissolution shall be in the form of a motion and similar in substance to a withdrawal of request for dissolution but shall be verified and filed prior to publication of the order setting the deadline for filing objections to the petition. Section 138. Involuntary dissolution. A corporation may be dissolved by the commission motu proprio or upon filing of a verified complaint by any interested party. The following may be grounds for dissolution of the corporation. A. Non-use of corporate charter is provided under Section 21 of this Code. b. Continuous in operation of a corporation is provided under Section 21 of this Code. c. Upon receipt of a lawful court order dissolving the corporation. d. Upon finding by final judgment that the corporation procured its incorporation through fraud. e. Upon finding by final judgment that the corporation 1 was created for the purpose of committing, concealing or aiding the commission of securities violations, smuggling, tax evasion, money laundering, or graft and corrupt practices. 2. Committed or aided in the commission of securities violations, smuggling, tax evasion, money laundering, or graft and corrupt practices, and its stockholders knew, and. 3. Repeatedly and knowingly tolerated the commission of graft and corrupt practices or other fraudulent or illegal acts by its directors, trustees, officers, or employees. If the corporation is ordered dissolved by final judgment pursuant to the grounds set forth in subparagraph e, hereof, its assets, after payment of its liabilities, shall, upon petition of the commission with the appropriate court, be forfeited in favor of the national government. Such forfeiture shall be without prejudice to the rights of innocent stockholders and employees for services rendered, and to the application of other penalty or sanction under this code or other laws. The Commission shall give reasonable notice to, and coordinate with, the appropriate regulatory agency prior to the involuntary dissolution of companies under their special regulatory jurisdiction. Section 139. Corporate Liquidation. Except for banks, which shall be covered by the applicable provisions of Republic Act No. 7, 6, 5, 3, otherwise known as the New Central Bank Act, as amended, and Republic Act No. 3, 5, 9, 1, otherwise known as the Philippine Deposit Insurance Corporation Charter, as amended, every corporation whose charter expires pursuant to its Articles of Incorporation, is annulled by forfeiture, or whose corporate existence is terminated in any other manner, shall nevertheless remain as a body corporate for three years after the effective date of dissolution for the purpose of prosecuting and defending suits by or against it and enabling it to settle and close its affairs, dispose of and convey its property, and distribute its assets, but not for the purpose of continuing the business for which it was established. At any time during said three years, the corporation is authorized and empowered to convey all of its property to trustees for the benefit of stockholders, members, creditors and other persons in interest. After any such conveyance by the corporation of its property and trust for the benefit of its stockholders, members, creditors and others in interest, all interest which the corporation had in the property terminates, the legal interest vests in the trustees, and the beneficial interest in the stockholders, members, creditors or other persons in interest. Except as otherwise provided for in sections 93 and 94 of this code, upon the winding up of corporate affairs, any asset distributable to any creditor or stockholder or member who is unknown or cannot be found shall be escheated in favor of the national government. Except by decrease of capital stock and as otherwise allowed by this code, no corporation shall distribute any of its assets or property except upon lawful dissolution and after payment of all its debts and liabilities. Title 15 Foreign Corporations Section 140 Definition and Rights of Foreign Corporations For purposes of this code, a foreign corporation is one formed, 
organized or existing under laws other than those of the Philippines and whose laws allow Filipino citizens and corporations to do business in its own country or state. It shall have the right to transact business in the Philippines after obtaining a license for that purpose in accordance with this code and a certificate of authority from the appropriate government agency. Section 141. Application to existing foreign corporations. Every foreign corporation which, on the date of the effectivity of this code, is authorized to do business in the Philippines under a license issued to it shall continue to have such authority under the terms and conditions of its license, subject to the provisions of this code and other special laws. Section 142. Application for a license. A foreign corporation applying for a license to transact business in the Philippines shall submit to the Commission a copy of its Articles of Incorporation and Bylaws, certified in accordance with law, and their translation to an official language of the Philippines, if necessary. The application shall be under oath and, unless already stated in its Articles of Incorporation, shall specifically set forth the following. a. The date and term of incorporation. b. The address, including the street number, of the principal office of the corporation in the country or state of incorporation. c. The name and address of its resident agent authorized to accept summons and process in all legal proceedings and all notices affecting the corporation, pending the establishment of a local office. d. The place in the Philippines where the corporation intends to operate. e. The specific purpose or purposes which the corporation intends to pursue in the transaction of its business in the Philippines provided, that said purpose or purposes are those specifically stated in the Certificate of Authority issued by the appropriate government agency. f. The names and addresses of the present directors and officers of the corporation. g. A statement of its authorized capital stock and the aggregate number of shares which the corporation has authority to issue, itemized by class, par value of shares, shares without par value, and series, if any. h. A statement of its outstanding capital stock and the aggregate number of shares which the corporation has issued, itemized by class, par value of shares, shares without par value, and series, if any. I. A statement of the amount actually paid in, and. J. Such additional information as may be necessary or appropriate in order to enable the Commission to determine whether such corporation is entitled to a license to transact business in the Philippines, and to determine and assess the fees payable. Attached to the application for license shall be a certificate under oath duly executed by the authorized official or officials of the jurisdiction of its incorporation, attesting to the fact that the laws of the country or state of the applicant allow Filipino citizens and corporations to do business therein, and that the applicant is an existing corporation in good standing. If the certificate is in a foreign language, a translation thereof in English under oath of the translator shall be attached to the application. The application for a license to transact business in the Philippines shall likewise be accompanied by a statement under oath of the President or any other person authorized by the corporation, showing to the satisfaction of the Commission and when appropriate, other governmental agencies that the applicant is solvent and in sound financial condition, setting forth the assets and liabilities of the corporation as of the date not exceeding one, one, year immediately prior to the filing of the application. Foreign banking, financial, and insurance corporations shall in addition to the above requirements, comply with the provisions of existing laws applicable to them. In the case of all other foreign corporations, no application for license to transact business in the Philippines shall be accepted by the Commission without previous authority from the appropriate government agency, whenever required by law. Section 143. Issuance of a license. If the Commission is satisfied that the applicant has complied with all the requirements of this code and other special laws, rules and regulations, the Commission shall issue a license to transact business in the Philippines to the applicant for the purpose or purposes specified in such license. Upon issuance of the license, such foreign corporation may commence to transact business in the Philippines and continue to do so for as long as it retains its authority to act as a corporation under the laws of the country or state of its incorporation, unless such license is sooner surrendered, revoked, suspended, or annulled in accordance with this code or other special laws. Within 60 days after the issuance of the license to transact business in the Philippines, the licensee, except foreign banking or insurance corporations, shall deposit with the Commission for the benefit of present and future creditors of the licensee in the Philippines, securities satisfactory to the Commission, consisting of bonds or other evidence of indebtedness of the government of the Philippines, its political subdivisions and instrumentalities, or of government-owned or controlled corporations and entities, shares of stock or debt securities that are registered under Republic Act No. 8, 7, 9, 9, otherwise known as the Securities Regulation Code, 
shares of stock in domestic corporations listed in the stock exchange, shares of stock in domestic insurance companies and banks, any financial instrument determined suitable by the commission, or any combination thereof with an actual market value of at least 500,000 pesos or such other amount that may be set by the commission. Provided, however, that within six months after each fiscal year of the licensee, the commission shall require the licensee to deposit additional securities or financial instruments equivalent in actual market value to 2% of the amount by which the licensee's gross income for that fiscal year exceeds 10 million pesos. The commission shall also require the deposit of additional securities or financial instruments if the actual market value of the deposited securities or financial instruments has decreased by at least 10% of their actual market value at the time they were deposited. The commission may, at its discretion, release part of the additional deposit if the gross income of the licensee has decreased, or if the actual market value of the total deposit has increased, by more than 10% of their actual market value at the time they were deposited. The commission may, from time to time, allow the licensee to make substitute deposits for those already on deposit as long as the licensee is solvent. Such licensee shall be entitled to collect the interest or dividends on such deposits. In the event the licensee ceases to do business in the Philippines, its deposits shall be returned, upon the licensee's application and upon proof to the satisfaction of the commission that the licensee has no liability to Philippine residents, including the government of the Republic of the Philippines. For purposes of computing the securities deposit, the composition of gross income and allowable deductions therefrom shall be in accordance with the rules of the commission. Section 144. Who may be a resident agent? A resident agent may be either an individual residing in the Philippines or a domestic corporation lawfully transacting business in the Philippines, provided that an individual resident agent must be of good moral character and of sound financial standing, provided, further, that in case of a domestic corporation who will act as a resident agent, it must likewise be of sound financial standing and must show proof that it is in good standing as certified by the Commission. Section 145. Resident Agent. Service of Process. As a condition to the issuance of the license for a foreign corporation to transact business in the Philippines, such corporation shall file with the Commission a written power of attorney designating a person who must be a resident of the Philippines, on whom summons and other legal processes may be served in all actions or other legal proceedings against such corporation, and consenting that service upon such resident agent shall be admitted and held as valid as if served upon the duly authorized officers of the foreign corporation at its home office. Such foreign corporation shall likewise execute and file with the Commission an agreement or stipulation, executed by the proper authorities of said corporation, in form and substance as follows. The name of foreign corporation hereby stipulates and agrees, in consideration of being granted a license to transact business in the Philippines, that if the corporation shall cease to transact business in the Philippines, or shall be without any resident agent in the Philippines on whom any summons or other legal processes may be served, then service of any summons or other legal process may be made upon the commission in any action or proceeding arising out of any business or transaction which occurred in the Philippines and such service shall have the same force and effect as if made upon the duly authorized officers of the corporation at its home office. Whenever such service of summons or other process is made upon the commission, the commission shall, within ten days thereafter, transmit by mail a copy of such summons or other legal process to the corporation at its home or principal office. The sending of such copy by the Commission shall be a necessary part of and shall complete such service. All expenses incurred by the Commission for such service shall be paid in advance by the party at whose instance the service is made. It shall be the duty of the resident agent to immediately notify the Commission in writing of any change in the resident agent's address. Section 146. Law Applicable. A foreign corporation lawfully doing business in the Philippines shall be bound by all laws, rules and regulations applicable to domestic corporations of the same class, except those which provide for the creation, formation, organization or dissolution of corporations are those which fix the relations, liabilities, responsibilities, or duties of stockholders, members, or officers of corporations to each other or to the corporation. Section 147. Amendments to Articles of Incorporation or Bylaws of Foreign Corporations. Whenever the Articles of Incorporation or Bylaws of a Foreign Corporation authorized to transact business in the Philippines are amended, such foreign corporation shall, within 60, 60 days after the amendment becomes effective, file with the Commission, and in the proper cases, with the appropriate government agency, a duly authenticated copy of the amended Articles of Incorporation or Bylaws, indicating clearly in capital letters or underscoring the change or changes made, duly certified by the authorized official or officials of the country or state of incorporation. 
such filing shall not in itself enlarge or alter the purpose or purposes for which such corporation is authorized to transact business in the Philippines. Section 148. Amended License. A foreign corporation authorized to transact business in the Philippines shall obtain an amended license in the event it changes its corporate name or desires to pursue other or additional purposes in the Philippines by submitting an application with the Commission, favorably endorsed by the appropriate government agency in the proper cases. Section 149. Merger or consolidation involving a foreign corporation licensed in the Philippines. One or more foreign corporations authorized to transact business in the Philippines may merge or consolidate with any domestic corporation or corporations if permitted under Philippine laws and by the law of its incorporation, provided that the requirements on merger or consolidation as provided in this code are followed. Whenever a foreign corporation authorized to transact business in the Philippines shall be a party to a merger or consolidation in its home country or state as permitted by the law authorizing its incorporation, such foreign corporation shall within 60 days after the effectivity of such merger or consolidation, file with the Commission, and in proper cases, with the appropriate government agency, a copy of the Articles of Merger or Consolidation duly authenticated by the proper official or officials of the country or state under whose laws the merger or consolidation was effected, provided, however, that if the absorbed corporation is the foreign corporation doing business in the Philippines, the latter shall at the same time file a petition for withdrawal of its license in accordance with this title. Section 150. Doing business without a license. No foreign corporation transacting business in the Philippines without a license, or its successors or assigns, shall be permitted to maintain or intervene in any action, suit or proceeding in any court or administrative agency of the Philippines. But such corporation may be sued or proceeded against before Philippine courts or administrative tribunals on any valid cause of action recognized under Philippine laws. Section 151. Revocation of license. Without prejudice to other grounds provided under special laws, the license of a foreign corporation to transact business in the Philippines may be revoked or suspended by the Commission upon any of the following grounds. a. Failure to file its annual report or pay any fees as required by this code. b. Failure to appoint and maintain a resident agent in the Philippines as required by this. Title. c. Failure after change of its resident agent or address, to submit to the Commission a statement of such change as required by this title. d. Failure to submit to the Commission an authenticated copy of any amendment to its Articles of Incorporation or Bylaws or of any Articles of Merger or Consolidation within the time prescribed by this title. e. A misrepresentation of any material matter in any application, report, affidavit or other document submitted by such corporation pursuant to this title. f. Failure to pay any and all taxes, imposts, assessments or penalties, if any, lawfully due to the Philippine government or any of its agencies or political subdivisions. g. Transacting business in the Philippines outside of the purpose or purposes for which such corporation is authorized under its license. h. Transacting business in the Philippines as agent of or acting on behalf of any foreign corporation or entity not duly licensed to do business in the Philippines, or i. Any other ground as would render it unfit to transact business in the Philippines. Section 152. Issuance of Certificate of Revocation. Upon the revocation of the license to transact business in the Philippines, the Commission shall issue a corresponding certificate of revocation, furnishing a copy thereof to the appropriate government agency in the proper cases. The Commission shall also mail the notice and copy of the certificate of revocation to the corporation at its registered office in the Philippines. Section 153. Withdrawal of foreign corporations. Subject to existing laws and regulations, a foreign corporation licensed to transact business in the Philippines may be allowed to withdraw from the Philippines by filing a petition for withdrawal of license. No certificate of withdrawal shall be issued by the Commission unless all the following requirements are met. a. All claims which have accrued in the Philippines have been paid, compromised or settled. b. All taxes, imposts, assessments, and penalties, if any, lawfully due to the Philippine government or any of its agencies or political subdivisions, have been paid, and c. The petition for withdrawal of license has been published once a week for three consecutive weeks in a newspaper of general circulation in the Philippines.